today's topic that I have chosen is fracture tibia and fibula. And the reason is very simple. Tibia and fibula fracture is the commonest in the lower limb. It gets compounding very easily. So most of the open fractures we are dealing with it is in the fracture tibia and fibula. The fracture tibia and fibula, still there is a controversy going on and it is not settled. So that's why it is always a subject for the discussion among the doctors. And despite the newer innovations, as far as the implants are concerned, there are newer external fixated devices, but still fracture tibia is an unsolved problem in many of the cases. It becomes a challenging fracture for the orthopedic surgeons, how to treat it and how to give the best outcome to the patient. Fracture tibia and fibula, the presentation is variable and outcomes are unpredictable many times. And there is always two schools of thought, especially in the fracture tibia. What to do for the final treatment? Is it operative or is it non-operative treatment that will suit the patient best? Consensus still has not been arrived for the optimal management of the diffusal fractures of the tibia. Albin Lambotte was the first to introduce external fixation and that started with fracture tibia. The William Haygroves started the internal fixation with the nails and which was popularized by Kuncher and Lotz. Neo, if we know it, it is a great school of the orthopedics. They defined the practice of intramedullary interlocking nailing. Anatomical part a little is important because we have to many times go on the tibia, open it and fix it. And there are some clinical applications, so it is better that we understand it. It is triangular in cross section. And we know the medullary cavity is not uniform. It is flared in the proximal and the distal ends. It has got three surfaces, it is not round. And the surfaces are medial, lateral and posterior. It is thinnest in the cross section at a junction of middle and lower third. And we know the anteromedial border is subcutaneous throughout its length. This is also called shin and the smooth medial surface is also subcutaneous. It can cause the open fractures. Blood supply, it is through a nutrient artery which enters the tibia just distal to the attachment of the soleus. And inside the medullary cavity, it gives off branches ascending and descending and forms endosteal vascular structure or tree. Anastomosis also happens with the periosteal vessels and they arise actually from the anterior tibial artery. So this is the nutrient artery, you can see it is going inside in the distal to the soleus attachment. When the nutrient artery is obstructed, the reverse flow can be established through the cortex. Cortex means, it means the periosteal blood vessels, they start supplying it. And remember in the operation, why it is emphasized that the periosteal attachment should be preserved as far as possible because they can provide the blood flow through the complex anastomosis with the endosteal vessels. The tight osteofacial compartments surround the tibia and there are four compartments. So compartments are anterior, lateral, superficial, posterior and deep posterior and they contain different muscles and there is the extensor and dorsiflexor of the foot, the lateral inverters and plantar flexors of the foot, superficial posterior 
and deep posterior or plantar flexors of the foot. Now remember the clinical relevance of the tibia and fibula, there are a few more. One is intraosseous access sometimes is needed when you don't find the veins for the vascular access. You want to infuse IV fluid, this can be an easy method. It was of course done in the olden days more often. So it can, you can administer IV fluids, blood products or medication directly into the bone marrow. It is of course used in a dire emergency when intravenous access is not obtainable or is not easily being found. And there are two main sites, anteromedial surface, below the tibial tuberosity and one is proximal to the medial malleolus. But there are some complications, osteomyelitis and iatrogenic fracture can happen and if the fluid goes in the compartments of the muscles, there can be compartment syndrome. What about the peculiarity or the clinical significance of fibula? So fibula is a great bone otherwise. It does not participate much in the, in the weight bearing, but it has got other uses. Nowadays, people are thinking of using the fibular shaft length to estimate the infant bone age. They are actually discarding the old methods of counting ossification centers around hand, wrist or the knee. And another great advantage for the orthopedic surgeons is the fibular bone graft. You know, it is a gold standard in many of the surgeries, especially non-union in the fracture neck of the femur. This is because removing the fibula from its anatomical location will in no way affect the weight bearing. Weight bearing is done by the tibia. And moreover, the fibula is thin and it is long and it has got a great vascularity. The graft, which is the fibular graft, if you give, give it, the osteointegration of the implants is better. When you take the graft, both ends are kept and then you can take out almost all of the fibula. For the fractures to understand, we have to understand the trauma. Kind of the fracture is actually related with the trauma. So trauma will be greater if you find the fracture to be the spiral or a transverse fracture or short oblique fractures. Degree of trauma is further will be manifested and we can assess it that it is great if there is a comminution there and there is a great displacement, they indicate that there is a trauma which is excessive and they can be associated with extensive soft tissue disruption inside, which is not visible. If trauma is more, there can be a frank open injury. The good non-operative management is always preferred to a bad operative management. So this is how the amount of trauma can disrupt everything including the bone and the soft tissues and can be having a compounding effect. Okay, so what could be the mechanism of a diaphyseal tibial injury is, could be a direct injury, usually from the road traffic accidents or the penetrating injuries or the three point bending injuries. So high energy mechanisms produce transverse or comminuted diaphyseal fractures. And bending forces produce short oblique or spiral fractures and sometimes short butterfly fragments. There is a special name for a fracture which is called toddler fracture. This occurs in the very, very young age from nine months to three years and the spiral fracture of the TBI in its distal part. 
the distal part is fractured in the toddlers. Most of them go unnoticed. These toddlers, they refuse to walk and start walking after some time and then you go for the for the x-rays and if x-ray is done you see there is a callus formation so the from the hind side you can see there is a fracture how to start the history taking a detailed patient history must be obtained to arrive and understand the total concept of the soft tissue injury along with the bone injuries a comprehensive screening to rule out pelvis, abdominal, chest, and head injuries must be done at the level of the history taking. And if there is a wound, details must be obtained. For the tibial fracture, usually there could be two types. One is low energy and another is a high energy trauma. It could be direct or indirect trauma. Tibial plateau, usually axial loading with valgus or varus forces are responsible. Lateral tibial plateau is fractured more often than the medial plateau because something will be hitting from the lateral side more often than from the medial side and then the knee goes in valgus position. For the tibial tubercle fractures, usually it happens during jumping activities. Tibial eminence fractures, usually happens when the knee is flexed while the person is falling, usually from a bicycle. Or another could be fracture happening in hyperextension. The tibial playphone fracture, it usually happens at the playphone means the articular surface of the distal tibia is involved. And it usually results from the high energy axial loading. Usually, mesonovae fractures, it is a spiral fracture of the proximal third of the fibula, which is associated with a tear of distal tibiofibular tendesmosis and the interosseous membrane. When you find there is a fracture in the upper third of the fibula, which is a spiral, it is actually a fracture around the ankle. What could be the symptoms? Symptoms are, as usual, pain, swelling, and deformity at the site, whether it is upper third, middle third, or lower third, has to be obtained. And skin, because it is subcutaneous, anteromedially, bruising or discoloration may be found. Patient will be unable to stand, walk, and there will be shortening of the limb. The bone can protrude through the skin, a tent-like appearance where the skin is being pushed up by the bone. These are all can be said by the patient to the doctor. What you will be finding on inspection, attitude the limb, you will be seeing the external rotation. Where will be the external rotation? How to find? Actually here, patella is not the best guide. Patella will remain facing upward. The foot will be in the external rotation position. So that is happening in the tibia. The swelling deformity is to be noted. And what could the deformity and types of deformity are the bending or the angulation, shortening and the rotation all could be termed as a deformity. Skin is to be inspected for any bruises, and in old case for a scars or the sinuses. Muscle vesting is to be seen only in the late cases presenting to the doctor. And you have to ascertain the limb length discrepancy by looking at the medial malus. It is the whole limb length. And then for the segmental, if you find there is a shortening, you should ascertain by looking at the superior pole of the patella. For the physical examination, temperature is assessed. Usually it will be raised. There will be tenderness at the fracture site. Swelling is to be well defined and documented. The deformity, we have already seen how to do it. You have to redefine it. And while you are doing tenderness, you must ascertain for some pathognomonic signs of the fracture, which are fracture gap in the continuity of the bone, bony irregularity or step sign, abnormal mobility, and treptus on 
abnormal mobility. The muscle wasting, only in late cases, limb length discrepancy will be looking, skin for the blisters is to be looked and ascertained and you must palpate for the signs of compartment syndrome and the clinical signs should be elicited. Movement and measurement, measurement we have seen apparent from the diffuse sternum to the medial malleolus, it is apparent. For the true length, you must ascertain and fulfill the two criteria. One is the pelvis must be square and the second one, both limbs must be put in similar positions and then you take their length from the ASIS to the medial malleolus. For the segmental femoral from ASIS to the medial joint line and TBL is from the medial joint line to the medial malleolus. Neurological or the vascular examination, neurological, TBL nerve, common peroneal nerve, sural saphenous, the vascular is the salis pedis pulsation, posterior TBL pulsation and capillary refilling time. There is a Thirschne Austern classification, it is for the soft tissue damage which is minimal or absent, grade 0, grade 1 superficial abrasion or confusion and the fracture configuration is a bit more severe than the 0 1. And grade 2, deep contamination in abrasion, localized skin or the muscle contusion from direct trauma, and there could be impending compartment syndrome. But grade 3 is extensively crushed, confused skin, along with the severe muscle damage. And there is a compartment syndrome which has come clinically clear. Can be rupture of a major blood vessel as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Go through the slides two times and never forget. Send your feedback and comments to me. Thank you very much.